a lot of um sorry lot, i forgot to hit record guys that's okay <laughs> <laughs> a lot of meetings uh regarding the new cfr re regulations these are the regulations for the older americans act the Older Americans Act has been reauthorized a number of times, but the regulations were only tweaked minorly. The, this is a full rewrite of the uh, federal regulations. They have not been changed fully since 1988. So, what? There's a lot of meetings. The feds, the um, um, administration on community living is giving trainings to all the area agencies on aging and provider community, and the state is giving them this, uh, a lot of nutrition regulations right now, focusing on the new nutrition requirements. Um, so the way this goes is the feds have, have given us the their final version of the federal regulations. Now it has to be incorporated into the state regulations and state policy and procedure and a whole bunch of training has to happen. So that's where we're in the process right now uh, of doing all of that. So uh, it feels like that's all I do is in, in, in meetings. We also are having um, a fair amount of meetings about wait lists. The state, as you know, we have wait lists for most of our services. Um, yep. Wait lists have to be managed. It's a requirement to manage our wait lists. So we have to go through and make sure people are eligible. Um, it is very time consuming when our providers like um, VIA have over a thousand people on a waiting list. Um, Project Angel Heart has 500 on a waiting list. Uh, Volunteers of America, 700 on a waiting list. That is a lot of work to maintain and vet those waiting lists. The state heard our concerns and has really been trying to figure out a, a process to manage those wait lists, to, to look at prior to prioritization, right? How do we prioritize people? Um, really focusing on that are on the wait list. Um, if you are low income, if you're you're in that category of of uh, most in need, then you're going to go higher on on the wait list than other people might. Uh, uh, Travis uh, and Aaron from Sharon's team, they are attending all of those meetings. Thank thank you guys because they are difficult. Um, to to listen, uh, all the AAAs are participating. We're trying to get some some standardization, but also uh, making it a reduced administrative burden, not only on our staff but also on um, the contracted uh, the, the the folks that are uh, service providers with us. I've also been meeting with contractors. Um, I met this month with a little help, Project Angel Heart, Volunteers of America, and VIA. Um, there are common concerns. The common concerns are waiting lists are large, service demand is high, volunteers are very hard to find, they all need funding, and many of them have lost funding from cities or counties, so a lot of Service providers got money under the ARPA funds from cities and counties, and that money is gone um, or fast. It, it has to be spent very soon. Um, people are writing grants and they're not getting them. There's been a lot of concern. I'm hearing a lot of concern about Next 50 and people writing uh, grants for Next 50 and, and not hearing anything about whether they got funded or, or not, not getting any feedback. Um, I intend to meet with the executive director of Next 50 and try and talk about some of the concerns I'm hearing. Um, the grants also want something, there's a lot of grants out there for tech, you know, technology improvements, those kinds of things. There's money out there for something brand new and evidence-based. What we need money for are basic services, the basic stuff, 
food, transportation, in-home assistance, benefits, counseling, those kinds of things, not something new. <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's difficult right now. And technology is wonderful, but if you can't, like we have money in transportation to set up a, uh, an integrated system, but we have thousands of people on a waiting list for rides. Kind of makes no sense. Um, we're going to still work to improve our system and make it integral, but um, in the meantime, a whole lot of people are on waiting lists. Phil, can I just get through this and I'll answer your question when I'm done? Sure. Okay. Um, the common efforts uh, are many of our contracted providers are right sizing, as they call it, right? So they've downsized staff and they are focusing on the most in need. Um, so they've uh, had staff reductions as well as service reductions. So we're not, they're not serving uh, maybe as many people or in a certain area, or um, they're really trying to figure out how to serve better so they can serve more, right? So maybe we can't um, serve five meals on wheels a week. Maybe we can only serve three um, so that we could add more people to get three <laughs> meals um, a, a week. Um, that's There's a lot of talk and some of them haven't figured it out yet and are still trying to figure out what to do. I have to I'm very grateful that that folks have been honest with me because a lot of times contractors don't want to be honest about their challenges if you're a primary funder of theirs, right? So I don't, you know, they don't want to tell me that they're struggling and that they're cutting back services and that they're cutting staff because, oh my gosh, that's going to leave a bad impression and maybe we won't fund them next year. Um, they're, that's kind of over and they're now just trying to figure out how to get the job done. I'm very, very proud of the dedication out there in our contracted provider community. Um, they're also really worried about being able to stay in business and staying relevant. Uh, with the funding cuts, the funding cuts is really starting to, they're feeling it now. Um, uh, you know, they, they went into effect in July and we're almost in October and they're feeling it. Uh, and not sure exactly what to do, but uh, I think are over the shock and now are really trying to focus on how to get the job done. The, triples, the AAA staff, the same thing. Amazing work these guys are doing. You know, we had to downsize. And we have significantly less money than we had last year in our own division, $2.3 million less. Um, we're doing the same thing. How can we serve more? How can we prepare? We're preparing. So one of the things that the managers and program managers are doing, I think I told you this last time, we've been meeting to really try and figure out how to manage in this world of reduced staff and reduced resources and increased demand um, and all sorts of other changes, regulation changes, um, new, new programs, new uh, compliance responsibilities. So um, managers are really looking at work duties and work flow um, to minimize creep um, there is a lot of organizations out there that are, people for, are falling through the cracks. For example, Medicaid just went through a big redesign and a lot of people got dropped off of Medicaid. Once you get dropped off of Medicaid, you don't have a Medicaid case manager anymore. So someone needs to help you get back on Medicaid. That really isn't in our job description but we're trying to do that in case management as well as in the SHIP program because they have that's a minimum security net for those folks. 
but we are really monitoring what people are doing and trying to keep, there's so much need out there. There's so many people, you can talk to someone and they'll say, you're trying to get them a transportation and you say, well, I'm gonna have to put you on a waiting list. And they say, well, can you help me? Of course we can't, unfortunately, we can't um, do that. But that's what you get constantly are those requests. People are in huge need. Um, focusing on compliance, the state is really focusing on compliance. We've done well in our audits. We will continue to do well in our audits, but it's recommitting to compliance. When you have less staff and a lot more demand, it's easy to let documentation drop off. We can't let that happen. So managers and program managers are really focusing on that. Ensuring quality, um, doing documentation reviews and field visits, um, cross-training. The staff, the managers ha have been working with staff to get them cross-trained. For example, several um, staff being are, are cross-trained in SHIP. We're about to go into open enrollment, right? That's when the phones start ringing off the hook. And so we've got several staff that are cross-trained and will be dedicating a portion of their work day or work week to the SHIP program to help us maintain uh, and, and respond to those calls as fast as we can. The demand in SHIP is surprisingly big right now, and I'm worried about what open enrollment looks like. Um, all of this, the managers and the program managers are trying to, to reduce burnout. Burnout is very real. It is very hard. I know you've heard me say this. I'm gonna to continue to say it. It's very hard to say, we don't have a service for you right now. I understand you need this help right now. I Here's what I can do for you right now. Yes, I understand. I'm so sorry you're having to go through this. Um, this is the best we can do. I'm gonna put you on this waiting list and this waiting list, and I'm gonna give you this number as a referral. Please talk to this person at this place um, uh, and tell them your story, or I can do a call with you. It is hard to hear those stories and not just one, I mean, multiple of those kinds of things every single day. We don't have a lot of resources to do staff recognition um, or support or training. And so we've really come together as a management team, figuring out how to do that in small ways and supporting our staff because they really, really do amazing work. They help people every day in crisis and improve uh, th their lives regularly in significant ways. Um, and I'm, I'm so proud of what they're doing. Uh, that's the end of my report. Phil, you had a question. I'm sorry, uh, just needed to get through. And then Dave, Phil first and then Dave. Yes, uh, you mentioned CFR. Uh -huh. uh, we don't get our little, uh, like the Dr. Cog board gets, uh, which is the uh, <laughs> acronyms. And so could you please explain CFR? That's question one. Question two, I think I heard a little bit about manage wait list means you're checking eligibility of those folks that are on the wait list. Is there anything more to manage the wait list? That uh, yeah, it, it's checking eligibility for sure. It's assessing need right at the most at risk. It's um, making sure that you still need the services. Unfortunately, people are dying on our waiting lists. Um, uh, we need to keep them current and understanding. Um, uh, Erica, I know you're on. Do you want to talk any more about the waiting list? Because your staff has to do ours internally. I caught her off guard, sorry. She may be doing something else. Well, and I'll, I'll ask the other question or I'll make a comment. Uh, one of the things that uh, our local Meals on Wheels, which is not a contractor for the AAA, is doing is delivering more meals less frequently. Yeah. We are really trying to get away from frozen meals um, in many areas. We know that people consume hot meals more than frozen meals. But we still do that. Um, so like the Eastern Plains, they get served 
Uh, Travis helped me out twice a twice. Is it twice a month or once a month? I, I'm it's not 100% certain on that. Okay. Um, they're, they've done that. They've reduced the amount of trips that go out to the Eastern Plains and they take more food. It's frozen food, um, but it's it's still food if people need it. Unfortunately, it's not consumed at the level that we would hope. Um, so and by some people, I, when I was delivering Meals on Wheels to folks during, um, uh, after uh, a Senior Hub closed, I, I got to go into people's houses and see, um, you know, what they're doing. And I was trying to put food in a freezer filled with Meals on Wheels. And I'm like, you're not eating these. What's going on? Um, so we're working on that as well. Remember what CFR stands for. It's the federal code of regulate. I'm going to code of federal regulations. I have no idea. I'm making that up. It might be it. You, you said the federal. Correctly. What? That's correct, Jayla. Code of federal regulations. <laughs> um, so the. Uh, uh, code of federal regulations is 45, the number is 45, and the, the specific parts of the code of federal regulations are 1321, 1322, and 1324. Thank you. And then Dave had a question, I think. I do. I've actually got two. Um, first thing is, uh, are wait lists currently being based on need or is that something that's coming? Um, what do you, uh... I mean, depending on transportation, anybody who has a wait list that's a contractor with Dr. Cog, is, are those lists right now based on need or is that something that you guys are working on to basically make a universal thing across everybody who's receiving money? Waiting lists are required by the State Union on Aging. So we have to keep waiting lists and we have to report them. Okay. Um, then how we prioritize those people on the waiting list is uh, um, we're trying to standardize across the state, which is proving very hard um, and um, uh, challenging because AAAs look different, you know, across the state. Um, when we were talking with VIA, Travis and I, um, they were talking about really trying to prioritize, going back to the old days, I think you'll remember this, Dave, is when we prioritize medical trips and nutrition trips, really looking at their population of who are taking trips and trying to maybe limit the number of trips they can take in a month um, and prioritizing those trips that are medical and nutrition um, based. So, uh, you know, for me, I really believe transportation equals quality of life because when you can't drive, you're just isolated and stuck at home and watching TV. And that's not a quality of life, in my opinion. Some people love that. Um, but when you're able to go to the library or go to volunteer or go to the senior center, right? Um, your life is enriched. And those unfortunately are being, um, those have less priority than those medical trips and uh, the nutrition trips. Travis, do you want to say anything more about that? I mean, I think everybody across the board is trying to figure out the best way to prioritize and, and get, you know, meet some of the demand serve more people. So, I mean, I, it, you know, whether it's reducing the number of meals, whether it's reducing the number of trips people get, I mean, it's all changing things to serve as many people. Um, unfortunately, you know, not, it means that somebody might not get their entire needs met by our program. Um, and we're also trying to figure out how to capture that as well. Uh, but yeah, pretty much across the board, you know, creating standardized prioritization based on the targeted groups of the Older Americans Act is what the state's working on um, for each individual service. I guess that leads me to my second question or uh, suggestion anyway, is consistent messaging, you know, about those lists. 
for people, for consumers, you know, making sure that they know what it is, if that's the way this is going to be, you know, I'm an information and resource person. So that's, it, it, it would, and it would be good for us to know what that messaging is for consistency, to make sure that we're not making promises or making statements that somebody else can't keep. Um, the other big need that I've seen a lot lately, and I know everybody knows this, is case management. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, it's really maybe for the person, but a lot of times what I'm getting right now are those caregivers that just need to help figure it out, especially in these tighter times, is that case management model, somebody who can consistently follow them to help them navigate, very similar to what Nathan's program does in terms of some help with navigation, but across the board has been something that I've seen a bump in lately as well. That's all I got, but thank you for answering the questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, Dave, Dave, that's an excellent suggestion. I don't think we're doing a great job in communicating that. I am feeling really uncomfortable. You know, we're required to go out and do resource fairs and, you know, promote our services. It makes me so uncomfortable because all we're doing is, is uh, putting people on waiting lists, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very frustrating to go out and talk about how wonderful the services, you want to say the services could be. They are when you get them. They're wonderful, but um, it's the, the the demand is is so high. Um, one thing I forgot to say, and that is, I've had the opportunity, thanks to Rich, to do um, two candidate forums, introduce aging to these candidate forums. Um, the candidates are for uh, Colorado legislators, and um, uh my job is just to kind of set the stage for aging and then they answer a series of of um of questions about aging it it was really um shocking how many people really didn't know a lot about aging um i think the other thing that was uh that i heard over and over when people started to talk about the need for transportation and housing those were the top two things that came up and fraud prevention um uh folks were talking about uh 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 the the barrier being um tabor and that nothing could happen unless tabor was repealed and i you know how long have we been trying to do that um there were a couple of legislators that said, hey, this is about priority. I don't know if Tabor's ever going to go away, but what has to happen is older adults have to become a priority for for uh, the legislature, and that's not happening. Um, I think it is, uh, I, I think, Dave, you've given me something to think about on how do we communicate this to people, and so that you're not giving false information to folks um, and you're setting realistic expectations for those folks here. You can call this number and then they're gonna talk to you about the resources that are, that are available. This is what I would suggest you say, you're probably gonna be put on a wait list, right? Um, right. Uh, and, and it depends. And if you wanna know how long it's gonna take, ask them uh, and they can give you the best, uh, their best information. Tell them to highlight if they have any medical needs. Tell them to highlight um, their needs. Don't be, you know, strong and tough. Be honest about your needs and about your abilities. Those people that are by themselves and don't have an, a caregiver, they're going to be prioritized as well. There's a number of prior, prioritizations um, <laughs> uh, that that we use. So um, I, I think that's important. And Jayla, I mean long time ago, Kelly, I hate to throw you under the bus a little bit, but you did this thing years ago, which was how to deliver not great news to people when that's what you got. And I remember that. I'm sure I have that book somewhere in my massive pile of papers, but with all the new people that are involved in this from this day, you know, currently, maybe something like that to give some consistency across the board would be a good thing. I, I know how to do this. Hey, do and you Erica, think you and I, I could put together some chat. kind of webinar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, just something for consistency across the board for 
those of us that are doing this, that way we're not sending people to other people to get the same answer because nobody wants to be shuffled. Yeah, and no, that, that's exactly. when you really, it's, really it's, get some angry and frustrated people is when that happens. It feels cruel, doesn't it? To say, oh, there's these services out there, but you're not going to be able to get them right away. <laughs> right. right. I, it's I think just that's, a thought and it's off the, cuff, yeah. it's off no, the top um, of my head. Mindy, but... can you make a note to set up a meeting with Dave and I so we can get a webinar put together? All righty. Um, just to put in there, Erica has put some information in the chat about our case management and in, in caregiver program. And Paul Hazeman has his hand up. <laughs> and I see Andrea's comment as well for Arapahoe County. Um, they're already at a thousand and not taking names. Um, I, Paul, I see you have your hand raised, but I believe Sharon had a question as well. Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Um, I was just going to kind of, I mean, I think Dave said exactly what, um, because we're seeing a lot of people give out resources and I don't give out a resource unless I talk to the people that I'm, you know, that are the resource. And I know what's going to be said because, you know, it feels good for someone to send someone somewhere like, okay, you know, whew, I, I, I got to send them somewhere, but the, and the burnout that you talked about is really, really real. And that needs to, I think, be addressed on a, on a, on a bigger level and, and valuing the type of work that's, that's happening. And maybe the grants can, um, you know, help boost salaries and, 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 and pay people what they're worth to do this work. Um, and the other thing is, you know, when we're talking about prioritizing and only helping those that are most in need, we are really making a longer train, right? We're not doing anything preventatively and there is no stopping, um, it's that part is really frustrating to me that where I think a lot of organizations who are only in crisis mode will never see the end of a line. And I think that, you know, when, when we're talking to partners and they're only focusing on crisis, it's, it's, we're, yeah, we're you're just, right. You're right? absolutely right. I mean, you are. Uh, and, and so and, how and do we, how do, you, how do we help with the, maybe doing, you know, 40% with that and then 40, you know, 20%. Yeah, here's here, the like, thing, the regulations require the most in need, right? And so we get right. audited on that, you get audited on that. Um, I, and so I agree with you that that should shift because if we, we could catch it sooner, right? Because by the time those that called us Maybe they 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 didn't they're on our waiting list, but they're not most in need until six months later. And now they're most in need, but now they got five more issues that they're dealing with. I totally right. understand that. So I think that's something that we should strive to work for. Um I just I kind of don't know. I don't know quite how to do that, but I, I would love to talk more about that. Maybe. In that meeting, Dave, we could talk about that a little bit more, not only just talking at people, but getting some feedback. Um, and, and inclusivity for all. I mean, all yeah. of our, uh, all the contractors, everybody who's receiving funds. So again, we're Absolutely. all on the same page. No, I'd I love know that. you have these meetings already. So it's just another thing to add to that. I, yeah, yeah, we probably won't do it in a standard meeting, but, um, or maybe we can. I, I don't, we have to talk with Sharon and, because they have an agenda, but I really would like to do this. And I'm not sure, do you think it only has to be um, for our contracted providers or should we open it up to community, other community service, like libraries and those kinds of things as well? I mean, if you're asking, I, I think that starting with our contractors is a great way to go and then moving beyond that is that ripple effect to make sure anybody who's interested in providing that kind of service 
that kind of consistency can be part of that conversation because it's not all about Dr. Cog. There are plenty of organizations out there that are providing services for older adults in our communities. I, I think that that invitation to a lay of the land, and then this is how we're messaging it to people. So we're trying to make everybody's life easier in these very yeah. difficult times yeah. is part of it. And I'm just spitballing here. So I, no, I don't know. No, that's care. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Paul. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wynn. Uh, at the, our last meeting, I, and, and I just heard it again, Jayla, when you said that uh, that the you were told that we needed to, by the legislator, to put more emphasis, make a priority for seniors uh, in your early, in your commentary just now. At our last meeting, we talked about trying to see what we can do to organize the ACA members and other members that could be a coalition or maybe it's just ACA and be able to approach legislatures as one unit versus each of us thinking it's a good idea to talk to them separately. So I yeah, bring- you, So um, Rich is gonna talk about that when he presents later on today. Great. I lower my hand. <laughs> Are there other questions for Jayla? Since I see none, I will admit that I skipped the time for public comment. So before we go further in the agenda, let me uh, ask if there is anyone here for public comment. And seeing none, we will proceed to uh, approval of the consent agenda, which consisted of the minutes of our August 23rd meeting. Do I hear such a motion? Moved. So moved. Second. Very good. It's moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Who's seconded, please? Who's seconded? Paul Hazeman seconded. Oh, thanks, Paul. Okay. And I think that was Phil, right? Who? Yes. Moved. All right. Great. Those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, um, I like to hear voices. If you wouldn't mind unmuting and saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Great. Thank you. The uh, consent agenda is adopted. Next, we move to informational briefings with Rich Morrow. And do we know if Rich is here? Yep. I just oh, yeah, there you are. Turned back on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so I've, um, Mindy, can you put up the power? Yep. I, I just I, put a few slides. I can, hold on just a second. Okay. That for us to um, basically follow the uh, topics I'll be covering it a handful of bills of the major bills that were worked on last session. And then we can have some conversation um, about where they are in the process of implementation and um, what we're looking for in the next year. I'm and getting, then, I'm, I any apologize. comments or questions, any comments uh, or questions that folks have too. So you can interrupt me at any time. <laughs> I am trying. I, I, I had to get in. I couldn't get in my normal way, and I'm trying oh, to uh, you might not be able how to... I can get this in, going here. All right. We'll give you a sec. If I get it. Well, that's not going to work. <laughs> okay. Let's, let me see if I can pull it up here. Okay, is that working for everybody? Good yeah. enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Can you pro can do I do um advance it or can you do it? You can do it. You just tell me when. Uh okay, go ahead. Advance. <laughs> okay, so I was starting with um House Bill 1211 because that came about in January and early February. Um, and this was the bill that um, 
that we presented to, um, I think we actually went first to Rachel Zenzinger and she agreed to carry the bill. Um, coming off of the uh, challenges we were finding with providers and, um, you know, Jayla's experience with uh, uh, Adams County that we had had last December. And um, we also had been hearing what you're going to hear again for next year that, oh, the budget's tight. We don't know what we can do if we're going to have money. And of course, we had the big um, advocacy effort that we were trying to get done. Um, at the same time, in January, when they do what they call the supplemental process um, to finalize changes to the current year budget that needed to be made, we kind of got wind that there might be a little bit of wiggle room in terms of some some funds in the current year, which would was the 23-24 um, budget year. And so Rachel was able to get approval from the rest of the JBC to create this emergency fund for AAAs and their providers. And they were able to come up with $2 million for that fund. And the state's been uh, in the process of <laughs> implementing that. Um, and last I heard, they had planned to have the guidelines for implementation of it so that they could start accepting uh, requests um, at the end of August. And of course, we're at the end of September and I haven't heard any other updates. <laughs> so, and Jayla, I don't know if you've had any any uh, contacts more recently uh, from the uh, State Unit on Aging about that, um, but I know they, they were planning on being able to put that out um, I believe the draft is supposed to, or they were going to release something to the AAA directors today. So when I get that, okay. I will share it with you. Okay. Okay. And I, I hadn't heard if they took my advice on the two things that I suggested they change early on. Um, and that was one, they were going to open it up to anybody in the state who provides a service that theoretically could qualify under the older Americans Act. And, and I made the point that what we pitched to the JBC and what they agreed on and what their conversations about the bill were, was that it was only for AAAs and pro providers who are contracted to AAAs. Um, um, I know that you caused them a lot of heartburn um <laughs> that's my they job had several meetings and they went back to the attorney general's office um but they have not shared what they what, decided yeah that's what i was afraid of um and the other one which was also i think created them a lot of heartburn was um when they first pre the, the first presentation i saw a while back when they were first going down this road they were saying and uh, they put two million dollars in this fund for the five year life, uh, cause it's got a five year sunset. Um, and I went, um, no, it's not $2 million total to be distributed over the next five years. It's $2 million it has to be available each of those five years. And they were like, huh? Oh, well, not, that's not what we thought. And so I, I I'm presuming they went back to their uh, a AG to talk about that as well. Um, and I made the point that the bill itself had $2 million appropriated for the 23-24 fiscal year. And then when the long bill, which is, you know, the state budget for 24-25 was adopted, it included a brand new line item for this contingency fund, and there was and then there was two million dollars on that line item. That's for twenty four twenty five. So to me, that means there there there's four million dollars available right now because the twenty three twenty four two million didn't get spent. So they said they would go back and look into that, and haven't reported back to any of us. So we'll see. 
um, I guess, Jayla, as soon as we find out, right? Hopefully soon. Yeah, as soon as I know, I will let you know. And or you I'm, should do the same if you get it before me. Yeah, for sure. And I think maybe uh, looking forward to, depending on what they end up coming out with, I'm I'm willing to consider uh, going back to the legislature to make changes to that law to clarify anything that we think needs to be clarified. So we'll see what happens with that. Ready for the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So the next one, which I, I think all or most of you are aware of, um, Senate Bill 40 was a bill that we had introduced with uh, uh, Senator Jesse Danielson and um, Representative Mary Young in the House, uh, sort of paralleling the advocacy efforts that that most of the people on this call, I think, engaged in with us at one time or another last last year, and we're so grateful for that. Um, part of it was because um, the JBC wasn't being committal, committal, committal. Yeah, um, they were being somewhat encouraging and basically saying, you know, we're if we got the money, we'll 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 do something and and that kind of stuff. But we wanted to keep uh, the issue in front of the governor's office, the legislature, et cetera. Um, so and the, so the bill moved through the process. Um, we had an initial in in the, in the drafted bill. We had a provision for it was mainly three things, right? It was um, requiring the state to do an evaluation of the adequacy of state funding for senior services beginning this year and then update every three years. Um, it also had a provision requiring the budget that for that line item to be increased by inflation every year. We had to take that out because the governor said he would veto the bill if that was in. They don't like automatic increases um, in the statute. And so we took that out and then we had the $5 million appropriation in there to, to mirror what we were asking of the JBC. So where we ended up was the bill had to sit in appropriations until the budget was passed, the JBC, or at least passed out of JBC. And they, as you know, the JBC didn't fund our $5 million request or any any of it so we decided to mount an effort to amend the bill as it went through the process and again with a lot of help from folks on this call and, and really around the state we actually got six million dollar amendment added to the bill in the house we had to do it again in the senate because of the way they do the process they strip everything off um, when the bill gets to the second chamber and you got to get them back on. So we got it back on in the Senate. And so then when it went to the JBC as the uh, conference committee, um, we were one of only a handful of amendments that had passed in both chambers. And so by tradition, they usually accept only those amendments. They did that this time, but they, they cut all of us down to $2 million. So we ended up getting $2 million. And as I've said to many people, never have we worked so hard for such little money. Um, <laughs> but that, of course, that was $2 million for the whole state. And you heard Jayla just say that her budget is more than $2 million short from what it was last year. So um, we're not planning on mounting that kind of effort this year. We were working through this Senate Bill 40 process. Again, the state took some time getting up and running on it. They've had a couple of meetings. Um, I think Laura is mainly working on uh, a draft uh, of the uh, evaluation from the, from the state's perspective and is planning to engage uh, stakeholders like the AAAs uh, and other interested parties over the next coming month because the bill requires the state to report 
or, or to submit a report to the JVC uh, uh, by November. And so they're working on getting that together. We'll see what um, her first draft looks like and um, we'll be happy to report back later on how that process is going and whether or not we think it's gonna accomplish anything. So Rich. Uh, yeah, Mr. go ahead, Phil, yeah. Um, <clears throat> The uh, bill said that it was by August 2024. I was just looking at the calendar that it's now the end of September. And, so they um, they claimed to comply with that by having the first meeting of uh, the AAAs in the state um, in August. That's an interesting interpretation of the yeah. bill. Yeah, I know. Well, the, and keep in mind, and Jayla, you can talk to this too. Keep in mind, uh, I guess I I would characterize. Well, in it, wouldn't the it be if a report were coming out before the the governor actually submits his budget, November one? Well, that was part of the reason for having it by August. But the the, the realism, the realistic, or the reality is that the department and the state unit on aging has been in quite a bit of upheaval over the last months and they pretty much just didn't have the people to do the work and yeah, five five key positions including y yolanda webb um are are gone so yeah um, so, and they haven't rehired they've rehired one of those positions i believe and that's it so uh does that mean that um if ever I have to do something for the state, if I can just say I had a meeting to begin with, <laughs> that uh, that's going to be sufficient for we had a conversation about it. Yeah, I I know. Well, uh, so it's I mean, up to us to hold them. To sue the state uh, in this, and we can sue them for you know fifteen, sixteen. 20 million, maybe. Maybe that's what we do: is we sue them for noncompliance. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, but that's that's where we are with that. And um, any other <laughs> comments or questions about that? I, I would say that I'm terribly disappointed with the yeah. administration. As usual, as usual, right? Well, if, uh, if the governor would ever learn to be able to say older Coloradans without it being written into a script for him, I might be impressed too sometime. Well, and, yeah, and I will say, and I'll get to you in a second, uh, Nathan, um, the Colorado Commission on Aging meeting, I think in July, maybe, um, Michelle Barnes attended that meeting. Um, uh, she came on first, she's the director of CDHS and admitted that, that, that the one and only time she had ever attended a Commission on Aging meeting was like in that, in the first year when the governor, when she, cause she's been with the governor this whole time. And I had, and others had been complaining to state staff and commission on aging folks actually for several years that um, sometimes these things got to start at the top and we didn't see any kind of leadership, not only from the governor, not really prioritizing funding, but the department never prioritizing funding and and what about the executive director of the department we never see her at any aging meetings and so i don't know if, if that kind of squeaky wheel finally got her to come to a meeting but she even put her email in the chat and said she'd be happy to talk to people um i sent her an email the next day i know bob brocker did i'm not sure who else did um requesting a meeting neither of us have heard back from her so it's been at least a couple months since that um so this is just kind of the environment we're in um and maybe i'll take the, this opportunity too to add that um every conversation i've had with anybody from the governor's office um listening to the joint budget committee um last uh about eight days ago and they got their quarterly forecast um all the talk was this is going to be an even tighter budget year than last year was sometimes they do that stuff just to lower expectation and to try to get all of us off their backs but i think it's real this time 
Plus there are a couple of different measures that are going to be on the ballot um, at the election that if they passed will require the state to come up with more money for these programs that will be taking money away from all the rest of us. So uh, it's just, it's frustrating that we're still at this point, but that's where we are. Uh, Nathan. Sorry about the del delay in unmuting myself. Rich, um, and I might be just be ignorant to it on our internal processes, but what can partners be doing now to prepare for the narrative um, on the appropriate level of funding? Uh, in other words, is there an ask there or has that already occurred? Well, I mean, I think it's 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 <clears throat> ongoing, right? It to me it's it's every chance we have to emphasize the need that's out there, um, the wait lists that are growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, ta Jayla talking about part of them having to uh, oversee their wait lists and review their wait lists is because they have people die while they're on the wait list. Um, and just continue to, to hit the on the points that the state is not stepping up. Uh, for its commitment for these programs. And these are programs that it's, will save the state money in other areas of the budget, mostly Medicaid. And uh, they still don't seem to want to prioritize it in any way. Um, yeah, Rich. And then I want to just echo the fact that I'm hearing the same thing that um, any expenditory funds are already bespoke. Um, so it, it might be an unfunded season on almost all bills yeah yeah i heard well, on uh just to add on to that i heard on the candidate forum that uh they got notice uh that uh medicaid is 150 million dollars underfunded for 2025 yeah yeah doug yeah, thank you, Rich. Hi, everybody. It's good seeing everyone. Uh, listen, I also, um, listen, we obviously, Rich, you can tell in Rich's voice, we're still frustrated from previous, <laughs> not even the previous <laughs> session, but in but in uh, a few years of um, of uh, trudging around the, the, the capital trying to get some additional funding. And listen, we're not, it's not disparaging every anybody, right? I mean, we know there are a lot of priorities, but we just want to be able to, you know, make a fair case for ourselves with regards to the needs of our older adults in this, in this in this state. I would say that, listen, the state is an easy target, um, but the federal government bears as much responsibility and, quite frankly, frustration as anybody. Um, we have not received any significant federal funding outside of the COVID relief stuff, but just our regular formula funds in many years. And it's, quite frankly, just straight up embarrassing. Um, I know they're in... Um, you know, they're they're having committee meetings now with regards to Older Americans Act reauthorization. There seems to be at least an interest in some funding, but then um, but then, you know, in the in the Senate and then the the conversations or the rumors of the House that that's probably not going to happen or not to the extent that the Senate would like to see it. So there we are. But I think that's something that we're really going to be be uh, switching our advocacy efforts and um, to the federal government reauthorization, whether they do anything in the lame dock, probably not, but early in the in the new calendar, I think um, that's where we're really gonna put our efforts. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. And you're on mute, Chris. Thank you. Doug, thanks. I just, I, I so appreciate you saying what you just did. I really believe that none of us are want to point fingers at the state or to the AAA, fully understanding that all of these cuts were incredibly difficult. Those decisions were incredibly difficult to make. And I would love to see how we can all come together with language and really uh, a very dedicated mission, how we can speak up to the federal level and express the needs. And again, to Phil's point, 
our governor certainly doesn't do it. And so how can we come together and start putting together some language and information around that? And how, how can we go about presenting that? That's what I think would be incredibly helpful. Madam Chair, if I may. Certainly. And by the way, it's great seeing you again. Great to see you too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, Chris, I, I love those comments and I, I really do. So we have a um, a relatively new lobbyist, um, Thorn Run Partners, that uh, we've been, we've had for you now, not quite two years yet, um, but we've been really happy with their, um, um, well, I guess their influence up in, in D.C., their headquartered in D.C., and they have someone that's dedicated to older adult issues. And I think working through them and we'll invite them to um, to work to a future meeting to have a conversation with you all, too, and to kind of get your input on what tax we should be taking at the federal level. But I think you're right. It's not only us, but I know some of their other clients as well, right, are very interested in this conversation. And maybe there's there's something we can we can draft an aggregate amongst all of their their um, uh, their clients, but also something that's evergreen that can be used by um, each individual AAA or whatever that might be. But I, I love that idea and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Thank you. Jayla. Yeah, great. Yeah, I just wanted to remind you that we do have a, we're working on a white paper, two white papers. Um, uh, Steve's, uh, Steve Erickson's group and our economists I don't know, Rich, if you have had an updated uh, or have met with them recently, but Not recently. I'm hearing it's a few that. weeks out. Um, but we are uh, we are going to see a draft of that white paper. The first one's just kind of on the need and the financial aspect of it, and the second one is on uh, the 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 uh, integrated health work that we're doing and how important it is to be able to sustain our current services in order to partner with those um, health payers and health systems. So um, hopefully by the next meeting, we'll be able to share that with you. I, I think it would be also, as you're looking at the federal side of it, uh, to recognize that <clears throat> money being spent through the Older Americans Act and the Older Coloradans Act actually save taxpayer money and save against other expenditures, particularly in the area of Medicaid. And to be able to not just say, hey, we need more money because there's more need, but also that the funding here is actually generating savings. I yeah, agree, Phil. We, that's, that's on our top line. Yeah. yeah. And sure. and Phil, maybe we can run that by you because uh, we do we do do that, but maybe there's a a different way of 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 saying that. Maybe we can get your help when when we're closer to that. Okay, sure. Thanks. Sure. And Paul, and you're on mute. I spoke earlier and Jayla said, uh, wait for Rich. So uh, are we done? Jayla, is that what Rich was going to talk about or is there something more? Um, uh, uh, Rich, you and I talked about uh, Director Hazeman's request that we uh, uh, bring together the, the coalitions, have a coalition of the coalitions and then also how the advisory committee could be involved in advocacy. So uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I don't I can, know if you remember we talked about that. Yeah. Um, so there it is sort of something like that right now, and we can maybe engage with that process. Um, a couple of years ago, through the Colorado Center for Aging, we reached out to several of the other, I call us usual suspects, right? Or the, like the statewide organizations and others that ad advocate uh, for older adults um, that included, uh, you know, AARP, Alzheimer's Association, Bell Policy Center, uh, Colorado Alliance of Retired Americans, 
Um, I think next 50 has joined. Uh, I'm trying to think there's probably a couple of others I'm missing. Um, to say, can we have an informal group at least that, but that meets on a regular basis, like a minimum of a, of a once a month, maybe more often during the legislative session to communicate with each other and to talk about, uh, you know, what issues we, we're working on or that we might want to work on during the legislative session and how we can help each other. Um, and also how, make sure that we have consistent messages when we're down at the Capitol so that, you know, legislators and, and governor's office and so forth are, are not getting mixed messages talking to different uh, advocacy groups. And so that group's been meeting like I say, for pretty much the last couple of years. And um, I think if if there's a way that we can engage, if you're interested, if we can engage in that, I, I think that would be, I mean, I attend those meetings, obviously, but um, we could talk about, um, I would suggest anyway, we could talk about how we might engage in that process. So some of the usual suspects are online right now at this ACA meeting. Uh, that could be, <laughs> but, but I I don't know that the ACA if us if our we usual suspects uh, have ever gotten together ourselves, and maybe we want to have a when maybe we want a subcommittee of some kind of three people to uh, interact with Rich or see if what steps the ACA can do if if any, rather than rely on Rich's usual suspects and and not really looking at the ones we have available here at the ACA. Or or even um, just combine us with the existing group. I tend to think with uh, legislators, there's power in numbers. So, but I, I do, I think that there are people in this, uh, on this committee who might be willing to be involved in a subcommittee to, to really advocate and, help you um uh, and and to help the cause because we all know it's so important um but not all of us have the time and you know something like what phil said you know if it's a uh, a set of eyes to review something to say oh this doesn't really resonate but let's reward it a little bit and it will resonate now um you know, there, there are definitely ways that we can help. And um, that whole thing about living a purposeful life, whatever your age is so important. So uh, well, your, see, your words we, are well received, Paul. <laughs> well, th thank you, Wynn. But I don't know that legislators understand that the senior population is growing and that seniors vote and whether or not in some usual suspects are probably reluctant to really take up arms against the sea of troubles with regard to aging uh, and votes and so forth. But I, so I don't know if we can be effective, but if I thought that, for example, there was a group that was going to rate legislatures on aging and that that, uh, that would be very appealing to them to pay more attention if they thought it was voting, not just sitting across a conference table deciding how to allocate money. Yeah. Very interesting to create, to create, you know, how there are um, agency or groups that rate people on guns or um, women's rights to choose or various different things. Why not the aging population? You I all think are giving Doug a heart attack. I could just feel it. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, a, a long time ago, we used to have a policy subcommittee of the area agency on aging. Um, I don't know if that's something we want to look at. We would definitely have to be in step with the board of directors, right? Um, and yes. uh, 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 make sure that Doug and the board of directors knew exactly what we were doing and approved it because um, we are a subcommittee of the board of directors. Mm hmm Hey, listen, I, I definitely think it's it's worthy of further conversation, right? I, I I'm 
I'm unaware of this policy group that we used to have. Maybe there's there's something there, but I'm I'm definitely open to having that conversation. Hey, listen, we got to try something something new. What we're doing now is kind of working, but not really, right? Yeah, exactly. Not well, at this point in time, I give the uh, governor and the administration an F minus. <laughs> <laughs> Is, isn't there anything lower? <laughs> is there anything lower? Uh, I would also, minus. <laughs> do, when we, assuming we're going to fo have follow-up conversations about this, I'd also be interested um, in seeing if we can, um, like the, the at the jurisdictional level of Dr. Cog's members, um, get your policy staff or if you have in-house lobbyists or contract lobbyists um, engaged and I can reach out to them or and help because we did we've done that kind of informally or on a case-by-case -case basis in previous years but and this last year with the advocacy effort um, it was really helpful to be able to work with some of say the uh, county human services staff and and some of the lobbyists for some of the uh, our our larger providers and that kind of stuff. Maybe we could tr try to have a subcommittee of the subcommittee or something. Yeah, um, uh, Rich, um, would you be open to uh, you and I having a chat about this and and really sure. and maybe with Doug and having exploring the idea of a policy meeting and and maybe um, Bob and and Wynn as well uh, to yeah, just talk too. about. Uh, if that if that's something that makes sense, it was under I believe Molly's uh, Molly Snyder when she was the director um, of the Area Agency on Aging. We had that policy. It might have been under Sue Aldrich too. I can't remember, um, but a long long time ago. So uh, and and some of those things that you're talking about maybe could be part of what what that committee would do, right? Sure. Um, but uh, I think it's if 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 you're cool with it, Doug, then then we should explore this for sure. Yeah, definitely. Let's have a chat about it. Okay, great. And then, so Rich, if you want to resume your presentation, I we don't want to derail. No, you. that's fine. I've I've got I think <laughs> just one last bill, and then the, the, the uh, a slide on the federal uh, advocacy that doesn't go beyond anything we've already talked about that or that Doug mentioned. So, um, but if there's federal questions, we can do that too. But why don't you go to the next slide and I'm going to. Uh, so I did go to the next slide. Do you want the one after this one? Yeah. The 1322. Okay. Should be. Yeah. So, and I'm going to uh, ask AJ to jump in too, because he, he's been involved in, in some of the meetings that um, Hickpuff has been having in uh, implementing this bill that goes back, it adds on to um, a bill from last year that um, has HICPUF, authorizes HICPUF to submit what they call a waiver to uh, um, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services to allow the state to um, provide certain community-based services, you know, kind of kind of like what we do in that health-related social needs area. Um, and this bill added specifically for the request to include um, housing, affordable housing assistance, and also uh, food and nutrition services. Um, I understand that they've, they've now gotten to the point where they've submitted the waiver request to CMS and they're going to be waiting to hear back. Um, I think I'm assuming that they will get approval to do that, but then there'll be a big process about how they're then going to implement that and what kinds of providers or other assistance uh, from the community that they're going to um, be working on. Um, and, you know, Dr. Cog, I think, has has some interest in this because of the work that we do, it's not, I don't, I don't know, we've not made any of the decisions as I don't think about per, pursuing it for sure. Um, but let me stop and see, AJ, do you have anything else you can add to what I've said about this? Um, not really. Uh, it was, it's 
No, we can't hear you. You may be having problems. Can't hear you, AJ. Yeah. We see you now, but yeah, <laughs> we the... can see you. You're, we're just getting squeals. Uh oh. How about now? Still oh, squeaky. Voice and squeal. Sounds like my brakes. <laughs> Oh, it's time to get your brakes changed. Um, <laughs> hold on one second. See if you can. This is inauspicious for my impending presentation. Yeah, that's, that's not good. good. How about <laughs> you? Can, how did that fix it? No. Nope. Oh dear. We can hear you better, but it still squeals. Okay. Here's my, here's my IT. Um, here's my IT you know, support. I will. Because I have nothing moves. much to add, so I'll just come off uh, audio and then switch to my phone uh, for a minute. Okay. But okay. Um, uh, yeah, try know, rebooting, well. AJ. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, and while he's doing that, I, I the department's had a number of you know large stakeholder meetings uh, over the last few months. Um, to get input on uh, preparing the the waiver request, um, and I don't know if there's if there's a timeline on when they expect to hear back uh, from the feds. Um, but if uh, AJ can get on, um, I I can tell you, uh, Rich, that uh, the AAA directors and I had a conversation yeah. about this and and they're not crazy about the idea to be honest with you um okay. well it's not fun uh, working with hickpuff huh <laughs> yeah we all have contacts yeah. with hickpuff and they've been challenging and uh so we would we would really i mean we have to get we have to talk with the tr other triple a's as well yeah. you know and really figuring out how we could do this the best way and if apparently there sense. there are some yeah. other alternatives that you don't actually have to contract with the health care policy that that you could be part of a benefit contract um that that's it gives you a little bit more freedom from the health care policy financing but but um i mean it's still a contract but it's not like you're not right under them like we are with the our, our other programs so uh th there are some things that we could certainly explore i think it's conversation that we need to have because i can't see how we're going to be able to keep up with the demand for services without some other source of funding. That's right. Part, um, yeah, that's what and this and so about. this might be the only way uh, to, we may have to look at this kind of partnership, but if we can influence the way it comes out uh, to be better than what we currently have with Hickpuff, that would be uh, wonderful. Yeah. And I know that, um, when I've had the conversation about this with Jarrett Hughes in the governor's office, he's been very interested in it. And I know he even put AJ in touch with the key staff person over there and AJ's had conversations with her. So it, it, it is a good way, potentially anyway, of folding in with the, that, um, what do you call it, Jayla, the integrated health. Yeah. Work uh, so, um, Rich, I think you should move on, and then uh, AJ is going to talk about integrated health, and yeah, maybe so he can talk he, about maybe that. We can include it in that. Yeah, yeah. So the last slide then was just on the federal uh, work that we're doing. So I think it. I think we've touched on all of this stuff. Um, you know, the, it looks like as far as the appropriations, Congress adopted a um, a CR. What's that mean? <laughs> con continuing, uh, resolution. Con continuing resolution <laughs> uh, that continues existing funding levels because you know the federal uh, uh, budget year ended September 30th so um, or ends September 30th sorry I'm jumping ahead but um, to, to continue it I think they said to, to December 20th so they'll have a lame duck session where they come back and see whether or not they just do another CR or whether or not they can actually uh, part of me would you know wants to wait because uh, till next year because we don't think there's going to be much of anything coming out of um, of, of the like Doug said the federal budget if it passes this year but um, we'll just have to see how that goes. So that's it that for me
Great. Thank you, Rich. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. And I don't know if AJ has gotten uh, his, his sound corrected. AJ, if you can message us if you're still working on it, or Jayla, did you get a text? <laughs> I'm looking. Uh, I, I do not have a text. I was thinking about um, figuring out what's going on. Uh, we all had trouble, or several of us had trouble getting in. Uh, oh. So I'm hoping that that's uh, not an issue, because uh, I can't do his presentation, I don't think. <laughs> uh, no. uh, yeah. AJ? Did that fix it? Yeah. Yes. Yay. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. Because I'm like, I don't think it's presentation. <laughs> well, I do know how to make an entrance, but I'm sure you would have been fine. <laughs> um, so I take it it's my turn. So yes, and let me put your presentation up. All right, thanks. If I can uh, community care hub go. and payor um contracting. Thank All you. right. Are we are we good, AJ? Can everybody see that? Looks good. Okay. Took that picture myself. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um uh so uh for a request from uh Jayla and the chairs, I'm here to tell you about. Um, the new funding we've received, uh, but I thought I'd start a little bit in the past and tell you how we got here. Um, so next slide, please, Mindy. All right, so we're, um, uh, we have started a community care hub and it, uh, I think is important to tell you what that is. Um, and basically a lot of you have, may have remember me talking about this in the past, but it's a single point of contact for um, a healthcare organization or other organization that wants to, um, th that has people that are struggling with their, what we call health related social needs, food, transportation, utilities, um, uh, has a population that they would like to get services for. So instead of going around and hiring multiple different community-based organizations, they can come to a community care hub, which manages a network of community-based organizations who can do that work. So they have an efficient way of interacting with multiple organizations. And as an area agency on aging, we have, um, I think at this point, 26 community-based organizations plus our 12 internal programs that we operate. And so we have uh, been working since about 2021 uh, to establish this. So. Uh, the the hub uh, will be responsible for contracting and payment, all the things you see on the screen here, um, uh, technology systems, uh, governance and compliance, all the um, kind of logistical and operational side of implementing a program and then sending clients to organizations that we're partnered with for services. Uh, and then uh, most importantly, uh, but most elusive is being able to pay those partners for the services they provide and the work they uh, conduct to provide those services. Uh, next slide. Um, so when uh, we set out to figure out how to diversify our funding, we had um, a, a list of goals and requirements we wanted to stick to, uh, meaning we didn't want to change everything about our organization just to get one contract. We didn't want to sacrifice any of the services we currently provide just to provide another service. So we wanted to do what we do well, uh, do it to benefit the older adults in the region, to benefit the AAA and our contracted partners, and to not and to avoid um, inventing a new product. Uh, so we already provide a range of community-based services. Our contractors have the ones uh, that they provide through the Older Americans Act, but they also have others. We would like to benefit from that expertise before we uh, begin uh, designing anything new. Uh, and I should have said at the beginning, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or comments. Um, uh, right, next. Oh, go ahead, Phil. AJ? 
Yeah. Uh, yesterday's Denver Post had an article in it about the city of Denver having a place, I think it's a website that folks can go to that indicates where what benefits, and this is not just focused on older Coloradans, but mm -hmm. um, that would help with the eligibility and assistance that's available, not just with regard health, but also could be rental assistance or um, other kinds of um, items uh, that, and I was wondering, um, one, are you aware of it? And how does the community care hub relate to what Denver is doing around helping folks know what they're eligible for? So uh, is, is that a new product yeah. from Denver? Um, I wasn't aware of that. I do know that they have um, uh, a resource directory that they maintain that's that's similar to that. Um, I think that's that's great. Ours would, or I think those are complementary efforts. Um, and ours, um, through the through the hub, through the technology where uh, we have and, and will expand upon, um, we're planning to offer um, a bit more uh, assistance than just um, here's an organization, please, please go to it. Uh, we would be, uh, for the most part, offering um, uh, a range of options to a client and then saying, can we send your information to this organization? Um, and then we would, which we're already doing. Uh, and then that organization could actively reach out to the client and, and help them enroll in the service. Uh, and now it's a little different than um, the yellow pages, uh, not to minimize. Uh, um, also, Denver's Phil, effort. we then we can see when the the uh, provider has uh, picked up the referral, um, when service mm -hmm. was delivered, and then eventually we would be able to pay for service for some of those services. So it's a it's a more comprehensive system that can monitor. Um, uh, the use of the service, um, the access that that older adults get, and then um, the payment or uh, yeah. what services are being utilized. Well, I I agree, and I think that uh, this, uh, as far as the community care hub, would have more accountability as well as transparency across uh, the items. Um, I'm I'm just mentioning it because um, city of Denver has a fair amount of population within the AAA service area, and uh, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if people don't get confused? Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Phil. Any other questions for now? All right, uh, Mindy, next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, giving a, a quick overview of, of where we've been. So um, starting about 2021, uh, we started, or I started contemplating this idea uh, coming out of the past um, uh, program that I managed. And in 2022, uh, we started really putting some effort into it. And uh, that included, uh, we used the um, some of the ARPA funding from the federal and state governments. And we uh, started a health navigation program and uh, we partnered with Denver Health and their hospital. Um, and currently, um, uh, uh, Juliana on my staff and with a little bit of help from uh, Zara, from the refugee team, uh, we're navigating people referred by the Denver Health Hospital who are over 60 and have uh, reported social needs. Um, we reach out to them, we develop an action plan, we send out referrals uh, to both our contracted partners. And then we also reach out to non-contracted partners because um, it's what the client wants and not necessarily, uh, we're, we're not limiting it to our network and, and I don't think we ever will. Um, once that was off the ground, uh, we uh, got a grant from the uh, legislature for uh, AAAs and we added um, the technology that Jayla was just talking about, the closed loop referral system. So that currently from the AAA, 
all of our programs can send referrals to our contracted partners. Uh, and the key piece of that, it's, a, it's, it's not unique, but it's rare for a community-based organization like ours to have that technology in the country. Um, and uh, there, there will be a lot more soon, uh, but we were leading the charge on that. But the key piece there is, is work that uh, Jayla and Sharon uh, and others have done to develop the contracting requirements, including the uh, insurance and cybersecurity and HIPAA compliance and policies and procedures, that governance side of things. Um, the technology is not easy, uh, but it's the easiest piece. And so I got to stand on those shoulders uh, and just deploy a technology quickly. Uh, it took about a year to build, uh, which was, uh, that is rare. Um, many other organizations are gonna have to go through the process of developing that governance as they call it um, with their networks. Uh, so we're a bit ahead of the game on that. So thank you all very much. Um, and then about a year ago, we hired Tory Fields Analytics. Um, uh, Tory Fields, who has uh, spoke to us at our last advisory board meeting and to the uh, Dr. Cog board. Um, uh, she is, that's not something I wanted to pop up. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Tori is well-versed in the world of health insurance. And after several years of trying with healthcare providers, uh, we realized that it's, it's gonna take a Herculean effort above the Herculean effort we've already tried to get them to pay for this type of service. So we pivoted to health insurance. And instead of um, trying to build that, the knowledge of how to do that internally over time, uh, we hired a consultant and Tori's been great. I'll uh, have some news for you in just a minute uh, on that. And then we also were, uh, uh, we applied to the, what's called the Health Equity Learning Collaborative uh, to design a new program uh, with Denver Health to expand our current partnership. And then finally, uh, most recently, uh, we're one of 20 organizations in the country to receive funding from the uh, Center of Excellence to align health and social care uh, to develop our community care hub. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and, and the Center of Funding Excellence is what I, uh, I'm gonna tell you about mostly. Um, and I wanted to give you a little background on that because um, that funding, the funding the Center of Excellence is using, and it's currently housed at the US Aging offices. It's, uh, they received the grant from ACL. Um, uh, the Administration for Community Living wanted to put some effort into establishing hubs to complement the area agencies on aging and others uh, to really uh, capitalize on the opportunity that is coming from being largely pushed by Medicare. So they funded the Center of Excellence to help um, work with uh, CBOs and states across the country to develop their abilities to work with healthcare. In turn, they sub awarded 20 sites. We were one of them, as I mentioned. Um, and that effort began in, um, uh, well, it, it, we were awarded in June and it began in August. Uh, next slide. Okay, so with this funding, uh, we have a lot of uh, exciting, but also bland opportunities in front of us. Uh, the first is um, I'll be working over the next few months to assess uh, the current technology of um, both the hub and the AAA uh, and our contracted partners uh, to uh, establish a baseline of what are we currently capable of and where do we need to um, build or buy technology so that all of us can communicate about client information uh, efficiently to streamline our services. On top of that, we'll be assessing the delivery costs and the current capacity of uh, each provider um, and how, and developing a plan of how to scale that when necessary. We're gonna continue, we have uh, funding to uh, continue work with Tori Fields uh, and her team uh, in business development. Um, and then uh, we're gonna work to educate our network partners on the new billing requirements that we're going to be accessing. Um, any questions so far? I think that last one was a, a big one with, with the sharing of information aj uh -huh. um how do you is it how do you avoid any hipaa requirements 
Well, that's the thing that I was speaking to earlier. We are in compliance with HIPAA requirements when we share information with our network partners. Uh, and I should clarify that when I speak of our network partners currently, that is all the AAA contracted partners. Um, and we'll be, uh, I'm spending the next few months reaching out uh, to those organizations to tell them more about this and uh, uh, get their active participation in the hub. But we're, we're, I don't wanna say we're set, but we are in compliance with all uh, code of federal regulations and privacy uh, requirements both from a, a cultural perspective across our service to the region and from a, a legal and contractual compliance standpoint. So in setting this up, what kind of security requirements to the data that is shared is being passed on or are um, by having a somewhat the uh, uh, sponsoring organization as the community care hub, uh, are we responsible for the security of all the data? We are responsible for the security of the data that comes to us. And when it leaves our system, it is the responsibility of our contracted partner uh, to secure that. And um, that is part, also part of the requirements uh, for Older Americans Act funding. So all of our current partners match that um, requirement. I could not tell you what the technology security is, um, thankfully, uh, but everyone is in compliance. And we have, uh, you know, I know Dr. Cog just passed its cyber audit and uh, we have people and um, who are well versed in this area who have, um, who are so double -checked. And our HIPAA audit. So this and is already audit. happening. Phil, yeah. this is already happening. Okay. Um, and, and we've already had this in place. So we just passed our HIPAA audit and the cyber audit, so we're good. In the community care network uh, that's being established, they have to be contracted providers then? Uh, yeah, we will. Um, they will be contracted partners, uh, yes. Okay. And we're starting with the current AAA contracted partners. Okay, so um, even though we may not be providing funding to everyone, um, because we're passing through a, a, a billing component, um, they're still going to be responsible for that security. So, okay, good. Well, I, I assume the lawyers are worrying, worrying about that, not me. And um, IT. <laughs> oh, sorry, Wen, go ahead. And IT, I'm sure. Yes, yes. It's hard to ruffle uh, Tim Feld's feathers, but I'm, I'm giving it my all. Um, <laughs> Uh, next slide, please, Mindy. Okay, so uh, here's where the, the other side of the ledger uh, comes into play. So yes, there are requirements uh, for billing and security that we're um, asking our partners to continue working on, but um, uh, through our efforts, uh, both within or our efforts with Tory Fields and, and separately, uh, we have a, a couple of good opportunities. So uh, in a couple of months, I expect to finish negotiations with Denver Health to implement the program uh, that will pay us and our contracted partners. Uh, and I'll go into that more in just a minute. Um, through Tory Fields, we're going to be, uh, we're about to start talking to a couple of Medicare Advantage plans. Um, uh, we might pursue reimbursement from a new Medicaid community health worker benefit. And this is something I was going to introduce um, when Rich asked me to speak, but um, uh, the state Medicaid agency has put in an application uh, to create a community health worker benefit, meeting staff much like um, ours at the AAA and at our community partner sites, um, to work with Medicaid beneficiaries to help them with their social needs like food, transportation, housing. That would be a reimbursable activity, but um, just the labor associated with connecting them. And then if you pair that with the 1115 waiver for food and housing, uh, there's a, a continuum of care for um, navigation to food and housing resources, and then um, the services themselves. Uh, I say might 
uh, because, as was previously mentioned, the state Medicaid agency is going to be $165 million in the hole. So I'm not certain the um, benefit will be a benefit to us, but we're keeping tabs on that. And if, if we can make it work, uh, we already have, uh, uh, we've worked on an agreement again with the, another part of Denver Health uh, to institute uh, or implement uh, another program. Uh, and the big uh, piece I wanted to get to, um, we have, uh, let's call it an agreement in principle uh, to work with an accountable care organization uh, to provide services to the patients of uh, some primary care clinics in the region. Uh, and that will be um, reimbursed through a new Medicare benefit. And on, on next Friday, Jayla and I, and uh, someone from Tory Fields Analytics team will be headed to Breckenridge to start um, meeting with uh, physicians and clinic managers to talk about this opportunity and uh, get them to start working with us on this effort. Um, I'm not jumping up and down and saying we have an agreement, we have an agreement because we don't have anything signed yet, but this is like 95% of what we wanted to start with. Um, and it's a, it's a good opportunity to start small and build over time. There are multiple clinics associated with this accountable care organization, and we can stage in partnerships to receive referrals and provide um, navigation services. Jayla, did I get the, uh, the excitement across, uh, but temper it with uh, reality? Yeah, no, you, you okay. were very like level. This is so exciting. Oh my God. It is. <laughs> this is, this is... Well, as soon as- uh... It's super scary. Um, but it is exactly what we have been working to do. And I really believe that um, once we get started, we're going to show um, how it can be done. Um, we've already got those those five Medicare uh, payment codes. I think services will, payment for services will come shortly. I think this is our best chance to get funding for community-based services that we have in the in the next five years, I I think this is pretty darn exciting. Well, I, I, from my perspective, AJ, you know, it's it's a big kudos because what it's getting is essentially folks that are actually benefiting are actually coughing up uh, some money because it would be the cost savings that they would be realizing if they're mm -hmm. saving. So. Uh, I I think this is this is very exciting. I mean, it's almost as good as a, a social benefit bond. Absolutely, and um, I'll just tie this back to the uh, as I said on the previous slide. Um, we're going to be helping our contracted partners with new um, billing requirements, and um, that is because the new Medicare Part B benefit will pay us through a, a clinical partner for the labor associated with delivering a community-based service. So I, I won't go into too much detail here, but when we send a, a closed loop referral through our system to, um, let's say, Seniors Resource Center, because I see Chris on screen, uh, Chris, someone from Chris's team will receive that information, start processing that client, reach out to that client, assess them further for what type of service, enroll them, schedule them, and uh, let's say um, uh, whatever, whatever service it's going to be, everything up to the point of the actual service would be reimbursable. So if Seniors Resource Center submits to us the appropriate documentation, we will uh, submit that to our clinical partner who will in turn submit that to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services when the reimbursement comes down, we will pay that partner um, for the labor associated with the uh, delivering the service. It's not the service itself, um, but that's um, a, a big step towards um, the service. So everything associated with, you know, if it's a meal, if it's from enrollment, uh, scheduling, coordinating with the volunteer to deliver the home delivered meal, um, everything to that point until the meal is assembled, cooked, and placed in a car. Everything before that is reimbursable, the labor associated with it. And that's a, a big piece. That, that could take a large chunk of the unfunded service um, cost um, away uh, through reimbursement. 
Uh, James. I'm trying to wrap my I'm trying to wrap my head around this. It, it sure. sounds like, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to hear you brief on this before, but it sounds like we're trying to get funding through Medicare, Medicaid to provide the social determinants of health to do it upstream versus uh, providing the straight medical care, direct care. Correct. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I th that's what I thought, but it's pretty, it's terribly exciting. It's it really just a, is. It's just a, the, the limiting factors, uh, for instance, is 165 million shortfall at state. But Yeah. And that's honestly why we're focusing on the Medicare benefit. It already exists. Um, and the technology we have, one of the things we're going to add is the ability to receive referrals to the hub, uh, to our system automatically from a clinical partner. So there won't have to be that, um, you know, a fax or an email, it'll automatically appear in our system and our staff can work with it uh, directly, send the referral out directly. Um, so there's not only are, is there finally some reimbursement, but there's efficiency associated with it. We are not gonna have to tell SRC, or we're not gonna have to tell the client, go contact SRC, go contact, um, Volunteers of America. We're going to ask their permission. And if they give it, we will say, all right, SRC is going to be reaching out to you. Um, and that is just a sea change from what we, our current operations. So I can't guarantee that every client that SRC or VOA will reach out to will enroll in that service. But instead of um, having to field 10 calls to get one client, there's the better opportunity of maybe reaching out to um, 10 people and getting eight or nine of them as capacity allows to enroll. So it's much more efficient uh, from a staff point, staff perspective, I should say. And will um, help reduce our waiting list? In the long term, um, yes. Uh, initially, so with the accountable care organization, uh, I don't want to put you all to sleep. So I'll just say those are organizations that are at risk meaning they've made an agreement with their payer, either the federal government or Anthem, to say, all right, um, I'm going to get $10,000 for every um, person I serve for a year. And they're at risk because if they spend more than $10,000 um, on that patient, they have to pay back the money, right? But those types of arrangements called risk-based arrangements only work when preventative services are available. And so on the other side of the ledger, when they spend less than $10,000 and still give appropriate clinical care, uh, they get to keep a portion of the, the amount they save. And the plan uh, that we will need to hammer out uh, more specifically with this ACO um, is that a portion of that savings would be used to pay for the rest of the service. So for our initial foray, um, we're gonna be very clear that we have no money for services. But after the first, hopefully, year, maybe six months, there will be further funding available for the services directly. Any other questions? Also, I should say the accountable care organization's name is Alidaid. Um, uh, and they're based in, in the United States, not Australia. So uh, next slide, please. OK, so as I've. Um, talked about uh, throughout, our next steps are to formalize our partnerships with our network partners uh, on the community side, uh, do the assessments of technology, um, uh, implement a, a technology exchange with a system the state is building, um, develop that plan to um, invest in our uh, network partners technology, um, and to keep developing new healthcare partnerships, which are, are gaining momentum as we speak. And Doug came on screen, so I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> and AJ, this is Wynn. Just one quick question about. Sure. Um, so we would be getting this Medicare Part B funding or access mm -hmm. to some of it. And it and it doesn't have to come through the state where there's a deficit that might 
steal some. Yeah, this is uh, this. Will, so the technical, the boring technical uh, definition is an area agency on aging, a community care hub is not allowed to bill Medicare. We can't be an enrolled Medicare provider. Okay. So we will partner with these clinical sites. They will submit the bills for us because there Great. is a specific code. And then they, when they receive the payment, they will give it to us. There will be, I'd imagine, an administrative fee. Um, all clinical sites usually pay one. We will pay that too. Um, but uh, one of the, the benefits, state. yeah. So the, the short one of the answer benefits, is no, the state won't be involved. Yeah, the state won't be involved. Um, and I'm, I've been, <laughs> one of our, our strategies moving from the beginning of, of the community care hub was to focus more on, on the Medicare side and the federal side, because they are both more motivated um, and more consistent. Um, that's not a knock to Medicaid or the state. That's just the reality of how Medicaid is funded uh, and their priorities. Uh, but Medicare has put a lot of uh, effort into working on the social determinants of health, health-related social needs, and we're, we're at the forefront of receiving that benefit. Wonderful. Other questions for AJ? Good job. Oh. Doug, yeah. Well, Madam Chair, I've uh, seen there's no questions. I just would like to take a minute and just thank AJ for all the work that he's been doing on this. This is extremely complicated stuff. And we've all noticed the need for us to diversify our our funding sources. And, um, you know, this is our first foray into this. And AJ has done some real yeoman's work in this. And we're so appreciative. And and uh, we're excited about the future and what this might hold. It's going to be small baby steps, right? But I think once we get going, I think there's real potential. So stay tuned. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If there are no questions for AJ, we can uh, move to Dr. Cog board reports. And I know Steve is kind of multitasking. Uh, he ended up with two commitments at the same time, but uh, we'll ask if he's available. And he may not be. So if there's no objection, we'll move to the county reports and we can loop back with Steve in a couple of minutes. Who would like to start? All right, Dave, Jeff Co. thank you. Sure, God, I hate talking in front of people. Um, Jefferson County Council on Aging, we're about to have a candidate forum. Uh, that will be October 10th uh, at the Apex Community Rec Center up at 64, 6842 Wadsworth Boulevard. Uh, the forum is featuring candidates that are serving all are part of Jefferson County. Topics will include senior issues around uh, affordable housing, accessible housing, independence, healthcare, safety, food availability, transportation, property tax, et cetera. So that'll be going on. Um, and that's what we have over at Jeffco. Very good. Um, let me get on my glasses here. Uh, looks like Gretchen is next and then Greg. Well, actually it was Greg first, but um, oh. I'll jump in. Uh, <laughs> the you. Seniors Council partnered with the Douglas County uh, government, and what we did was we hosted a three-hour interactive workshop just this past Tuesday called Aging Well, Finishing Strong. And the purpose of the workshop, uh, the first part of it, was to meet older adults, wherever they are, as far as age and medical status is concerned, and talk about how you can be the best version of yourself that you can be. And then after the break, we passed out what we called legacy binders. And we talked about collecting all the important information somebody would need to help you in the case of a long-term disability or in the case of your passing. And we started out, we've never done it before. We started out with the goal of having 50 attendees. We did fill the room. We had uh, two panelists, one being an attorney who handled uh, any kind of um, legal issues or questions. 
And I just went through the evaluation forms and it was a resounding success. Thank you, Gretchen. That's great. And Greg? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm with Adams County here. We on uh, last on Wednesday we had our political forum uh, at the Thornton Senior Center. It turned out well. We had uh, approximately five people from the county come and present uh, what they were doing for the elections and stuff like that. We had probably about 50, 60 uh, members uh, and uh, adults, seniors listening and making some really great questions for this. So it was, it was a good time for everybody. On October 30th, we're having our senior resource fair also this year. Uh, we're doing a Halloween theme and we have over 50 vendors signed up for it. So mm -hmm. we're going to have a nice big uh, thing over at the Bison Ridge uh, Rec Center in, in Commerce City. So if anybody wants to come and see that, we'll be there and looking forward for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from counties or other jurisdictional updates, other partner updates? When this is Steve, I am actually- Oh, good. I, I, my computer's misbehaving. I was actually trying like crazy to respond, but it wasn't letting me. So I apologize. <laughs> and for some reason, my camera looks like it's not on. So I, I do apologize. Uh, just briefly, um, we are working on the uh, the executive director review. So if any of you have uh, Doug Rex information, you know, feel free to forward that along. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Want to pay tribute to Dr. Cog, who got a almost two hundred million dollar grant working on decarbonization. At our last meeting, we talked about oversight of that program. I know it doesn't directly apply to uh, a lot of what this group does, but I just want, want to acknowledge the the yeoman's work that Dr. Cog did in terms of of getting that grant, and now the real work begins in terms of of you know, putting that stuff together. So thank you to to Doug and everybody on that. Uh, we are having a special meeting on Wednesday with one agenda item, and that is to consider taking a position on the RTD Revenue Retention Initiative. Uh, we wanted to do that at our last meeting, but number of people in the room that we needed for that. So we're doing that as a special meeting next week. Uh, at our last meeting, we also got a report on the Federal Boulevard uh, bus re uh, rapid transit project, which was very interesting, and another update on the Front Range Passenger Rail, which is, again, something that is very interesting to us. So that just gives you a brief kind of look at the things we've been dealing with at our most recent meeting. Uh, and uh, also want to thank staff for all of their work. A lot of you were at the awards uh, spectacular, that event that, that Steve Erickson and group did such a great job on. And just want to thank Dr. Cox staff and everybody uh, on the call that may have been at that event for being a part of a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I... Uh, we'll announce here that our next meeting is uh, October 25th, and we will be in person again. Are there other matters by members? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you so much, folks. Thanks, Wynn. Great job. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Be safe. Thanks.